Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev said in a speech that the first cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin flew into space but didn't see any God there. But why didn't he see God? Is atheism true? Was he just looking in the wrong place? Or is it foolish to suppose that in any sense God is supposed to have a body so that God might be literally seen or touched? My guest today, an accomplished scholar of the Jewish Bible, holds that the authors and editors of the Jewish Bible never really considered the suggestion that God has no body. Rather, the argument between these ancient writers was whether God had one body or many, and whether God had one personality or many. Dr. Benjamin Summer holds degrees from Yale, Hebrew University, Brandeis, and the University of Chicago. Formerly a professor at Northwestern, he's now a professor of Bible and ancient Semitic languages at the Jewish Theological Seminary. His research has focused on the relationships between biblical thought and later Jewish theology. His books include Revelation and Authority, Sinai and Jewish Scripture and Tradition, A Prophet Reads Scripture, Illusion in Isaiah 40 through 66, and the edited collection Jewish Concepts of Scripture, A Comparative Introduction. But he's here with us today to talk about his award-winning book, The Bodies of God and the World of Ancient Israel. Dr. Summer, welcome to Thinking About Religion. Delighted to be here, Dale. I would think that many theologically educated Jews, Christians, and Muslims assume that, by definition, God does not have a body. In your view, is that compatible with the perspective of the Jewish Bible? I think you're right that uh, the vast majority of Jews, Christians, and Muslims would agree that God does not have a body, and maybe even that uh, the fact that God does not have a body is crucial to the definition of the monotheistic God. But at least in Jewish thought, that point of view that God doesn't have a body and that that's an essential aspect of what it means to be God in a monotheistic system, that point of view really becomes standard in Judaism only with the philosopher Maimonides in about the 12th century. The Bible itself hasn't quite gotten there. I think we Jews read a lot of the Bible through a Maimonidean pair of glasses Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is that the biblical authors themselves did pretty much assume that God has at least one body. So why did this big change take place, and was it the Christians that led the way much earlier in this? The change takes place for a few reasons. Within Judaism, I think, though, it's more Islam and Aristotelian philosophy that begin to influence Jewish philosophers to think that God does not have a body or to come to the conclusion that God does not have a body. This begins already with a Jewish philosopher named Saadia, who lived in the Arabic-speaking world, and it becomes much more prominent and central a few centuries later in the work of the greatest of all the Jewish philosophers to this day, Moses Maimonides, also known in Hebrew by the acronym Rambam. Rambam really makes the non-embodied nature of God central to his entire theology. And Rambam, who grew up in Spain and lived most of his life in Egypt, he's very much influenced by Muslim philosophers and by Aristotelian philosophy. Christianity is not really having as much of an influence on him. He didn't really interact with Christianity, didn't know all that much about Christianity. So at least for us Jews, I think it's Muslims and Aristotelian philosophers who played a crucial role in leading to our idea that God doesn't have a body. At the same time, I think the biblical texts themselves play a role as well. That is to say, the Bible's own monotheism has a number of teachings about God that might imply that God doesn't have a body, but I think that the authors of the Bible themselves don't quite realize that implication of their own writing. For example, one set of ideas that are absolutely central to biblical monotheism is the doctrine that the one God, the God who created the universe, That God never has sex, never fathers a child, never gives birth to a child. So this God is very, very different from Zeus or Marduk or Ashur or Aphrodite or Ninhorsag among the Sumerians. God is completely not a sexual, not a reproductive being. 
And although the idea isn't that God doesn't have the equipment, uh, the idea is simply that God doesn't ever have sex, doesn't ever give birth. When you start thinking about it, the idea that the God who created the world is radically different from human beings, from animals, and also from pagan gods, in that this God is completely non-sexual and non-reproductive, that idea might imply that God doesn't have a body. But I think it takes many centuries before Christian, Muslim, and Jewish thinkers come to realize that implication of biblical monotheism. I mean, it could also depend on what we think is involved in having a body. Mm -hmm. Different philosophies would load more or less into that. If you're a philosophical idealist, having a body doesn't really amount to much. It's just that uh, there are perceptual ideas that compose you or something like that or that you're related to. Mm -hmm. Let me go back for a second to people like Maimonides and Sadia. Mm -hmm. Is there concern that if God has a body, then God is going to be composite and so not truly one? That's essential for Maimonides. If God is comprised of matter, and matter can be broken down into littler pieces of matter, then God is composite. So that's one of the reasons that for Maimonides, it's self-contradictory to think that the one God could have a body. So you mentioned having matter, or as an Aristotelian would put it, being composed of matter and form. Uh, I wonder if these ancients who you discuss so much in this fascinating book would have really loaded that much into the idea of having a body, that one is fundamentally a composite of matter and form. For these medieval philosophers, that was absolutely crucial, the idea that matter can be broken down and that a body is made of matter. On the other hand, I think that for some of the biblical authors, that might not quite be the case. And by the way, when I say some of the biblical authors, a crucial part of my whole point of view is that different authors of different parts of the Bible didn't always agree with each other 100%. I think that many religious Jews and Christians assume that the whole Bible is true, truth is one, truth is unified, and therefore pretty much all the authors of the Bible agree with each other. As a modern Bible scholar, I don't think that's the case. I think that all the authors of the Hebrew Bible are monotheistic, but they differ with each other on what monotheism really means and, and who God exactly is or even what God exactly is. In any event, I think that some of the biblical authors believe that God can be located in a particular space and time, but they don't necessarily believe that God's body is made of flesh in the way that a human body is made of flesh or even that God's body is made of the sort of stuff that we in the modern world would call matter. Parts of the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, also the, the book of Ezekiel, they have an idea that God's body consists of something that's incredibly, incredibly bright. Now, they have no word for this in their language. They, they, they can't describe it with any word that's available to them. So what both the priestly authors of parts of the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and the prophet priest named Ezekiel, what they do is they say that the presence of God is like a fire. They use a lot of like language. They're trying to describe something that simply can't be described in normal human terms in the Hebrew language of their day. So they're describing something incredibly bright that's like a fire, but it isn't exactly a fire. Perhaps what they're trying to get at, and they just didn't have the vocabulary to express this idea clearly, is an idea that we might associate more with uh, Isaac Newton. Maybe that God's body is made of energy and not matter. I think that for some of the biblical authors, Maimonides' concern that matter can be broken down into smaller pieces, that might not be how they were picturing or perceiving the body of God. Perhaps they're perceiving it as some sort of force, some sort of energy, and therefore I'm not sure that it necessarily is something that they imagine could be broken down into smaller pieces, the way that human flesh or animal flesh or a rock or a tree or a stone can be broken down into smaller pieces. Perhaps this is some sort of energy that remains unified regardless of its size. Maybe it can get bigger and smaller, but it can't be broken down. I mean, it's kind of unclear what, metaphysically speaking, is implied by God having a body. 
these medieval philosophers have a very rarefied set of concerns, you know, that God can't be in any way dependent on anything else. And if he had matter and form, he'd be dependent on the matter. And, mm -hmm. and I believe also they, especially Maimonides, would have a philosophical conception of divine simplicity, that an ultimate being just can't have any multiplicity uh, in any way intrinsic. But I would think that modern theologians and a lot of religious people would maybe be concerned that if God has a body, that entails that God is limited in power or knowledge or goodness. Like mm -hmm. you could lock him in a room or starve him or, you know, hit him mm -hmm. with a stick and, you know, surely God wouldn't be so vulnerable. Uh, how could an all powerful being have those kind of limitations? I guess I would say, on behalf of the biblical authors, yes, yes, and no. That in some ways they would agree with you, but maybe in, in one respect they might not fully agree with you. I think that the biblical authors who do describe God's presence in space and time, God's presence in some sort of form or energy or matter located in a particular place and time, in other words, what I would want to call God's body, I think that they would describe it as not being in any way limited. And I think that they share that concern with the medieval philosophers, though again, this is before Plato, this is before Aristotle. Ancient Near Eastern writers, like the authors of the Hebrew Bible, they don't have the philosophical vocabulary that the Greeks introduce into Western culture. So sometimes when they're trying to feel around these issues, they can't discuss the issues quite as abstractly as we can because that vocabulary hadn't yet been invented. It wasn't available to them. But in their mm -hmm. own way, in the way that they tell narratives about the presence of God or the body of God, I think that they are trying to intimate to us that nevertheless, God's body is in no way constrained and in no way limited. I think that for the priestly authors of parts of the five books of Moses, God's body is this extraordinary energy and the ways that matter can limit a creature who's made out of matter, they don't apply to the body of God because the body of God is made of different stuff. So my body might be limited in various ways. Your body, the body you know, of your pet, the body of Zeus, the body of the Babylonian god Marduk, those might be limited physically, but because God's body is made of this other stuff, this energy that's like a fire but much more dangerous and much, much brighter, that just doesn't have the limitations. You can't lock it into a room. You can't cut it in half. So I think that when they're talking about this substance that makes up the body of God, they are telling us that that substance is not limited the way that flesh might be limited. One of the things that happens, in fact, I think with that divine body is that its size is radically variable. At one point, it covers the whole top of Mount Sinai. And yet, when Moses and the Israelites build the tabernacle for it, it's able to go down in size and move into the Holy of Holies at the back of the tabernacle. And the Holy of Holies is just not a very big room. So it differs, I think, from human bodies in that its size can just radically change at the will of God. I think there are other biblical authors and other ancient Israelites who had a different way of showing that God's body was not limited, which is that they think that God can be located in specific places simultaneously, in different specific places, maybe even in different specific objects simultaneously all over the universe. In other words, I think that some biblical authors believed that God differs from us not in that we have bodies and God doesn't have a body, but in that we humans have a body where God can have multiple bodies. And therefore, even if you were able to lock a body of God into a room, it really wouldn't matter a whole lot because God has a whole lot of other bodies anyway located in heaven and on earth. So in their own way, I think that they are trying to get across the idea that though embodied, God is still completely unlimited. Could you quickly explain the widely accepted documentary hypothesis about the Jewish Bible that is just assumed in your argument? Sure. So the, the documentary hypothesis, it's actually not about the whole Jewish Bible, the whole Tanakh, the whole Hebrew Bible. It's really just about the first five or six books, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Maybe it also applies to Joshua. The documentary hypothesis, which developed mostly among Protestant scholars beginning in the 18th century, but really crystallizes in the mid-19th century, argues that the five books of Moses, maybe also the book of Joshua, were not composed as a unified book, 
But in some sense, you can think of them as more of an anthology, that there were a number of earlier documents that existed independently that were compiled together or edited together to form the five books of Moses as we know them. And in the most classic version of this theory, there were basically three or four main documents that were put together to to form these books. And the authors of these different documents, they're all telling slightly different versions of the same story, the story of where the Israelite nation comes from and what's the earliest history of the Israelite nation and even of the world before the emergence of the Israelite nation. But they differ on various points. So there are two versions, for example, of the creation story in the book of Genesis, according to this hypothesis. The first chapter of Genesis was written by a group of priests. The second and third chapters, that's the Adam and Eve Garden of Eden story, was written by some other group of ancient Israelite writers. We don't know who this other group actually consisted of. They agree on a lot. They agree that God created the world. They agree that there is one God. They agree that humanity is central to the creation of the world in one way or another, but they disagree on all sorts of plot points. If you just read the first two chapters of Genesis, the order of what is created when differs from one chapter to the next chapter. Theologically, the God of the first chapter is much more austere and transcendent. The God of the second chapter is much more imminent, much more involved in humanity. Different ideas of humanity also show up in the two chapters in Genesis chapter 1, human beings are made in the image of God. They're the pinnacle of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, humanity is made out of mud, out of dirt. It's a very, very different view of humanity. And these human beings, they, they can't even follow one very simple direction, which is all that they were asked to do. So these different authors, these three or four different authors, have slightly different recollections of how Israelite history and world history played out. They have different ideas of what the law is that the Israelites are supposed to be observing, and they have different theologies. So my book, The Bodies of God, really focuses on three different types of theology, especially found just within the Torah, within the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. The main thesis of your book is that the text of the Hebrew Bible reflects a sort of debate between two camps within ancient Jewish theology. So what is that debate? Some ancient Israelites, including some of the authors of the five books of Moses, believed that an essential way that divinity differs from humanity is that God can have multiple bodies and God has a certain fluidity of person, whereas Mm -hmm. human beings have only one body and we don't have that same fluidity of person. So in this point of view, which you find, I think it's a minority point of view with, within the Torah. It's found in two of the four documents of the documentary hypothesis. By the way, in the classical version of the documentary hypothesis, we talk about four different sources from which the Torah was put together. We call them J, E, P, and D. The reasons why we do that aren't so important for our purposes. But what I think are the J and the E verses, which are a minority of verses within the Pentateuch, There is this idea that God is a sort of fluid, uncanny being who can even be made ritually present or made present through a ritual in a rock or a stone or a tree, or God can just make God's self present at more than one particular location at a given time. God is just impossible to pin down. God might be nearby, but even when you know that God is, let's say, present in this particular rock, that is located in your temple or this particular tree that you've planted in a temple, that's not the only place that God is. So that God is nearby and and it is accessible, but God remains entirely mysterious and inaccessible at the same time because God is located in more than one place. There are two other sources or documents that make up the five books of Moses. We call them the P document and D. D really stands for the book of Deuteronomy. It's kind of off on its own, whereas P, E, and G are sort of intertwined with each other in the books of Genesis, Exodus, well, Leviticus is really all P, and then J, E, and P are are, are intertwined again in the book of Numbers. So the P authors and the D authors they reject this idea. I think that for them, this idea seemed too close to polytheism. The idea that there could be one God with multiple bodies, it begins to sound kind of polytheistic. 
Furthermore, I think that the ancient Babylonians, the ancient Assyrians, the ancient Canaanites, they did have this idea about their own gods. They thought that Marduk had more than one body, that Baal could manifest himself in multiple different temples in sort of little Baals that were the same Baal, but weren't exactly the same Baal. They have some independent existence, but at a deeper level, they're still manifestations of, of the same god Baal. So this way of thinking... For P and D, it just seems too close to polytheism, and they reject it. They say, no, there's only one body of God. That would bring up the question, though, okay, if there's one body of God, so how is God so, so different than us? Maybe he's stronger. Maybe he's you know much more powerful, knows a lot more. But if he's got one body and we've got one body, maybe the distinction between us is really kind of quantitative, less than qualitative. And so I think the way that the priestly authors, the P authors, respond to that is they say that God's body is different from ours because it's made of this extraordinary energy rather than made out of flesh. The authors of D have a different way of coming at this. They say, well, God has a body, but it's up in heavens. It's in a different cosmos. It never, ever comes down here to the planet Earth. And so nobody knows anything about God's body. From our point of view, it's almost as if though God has no body because that body is never perceptible here in our world. In a way, I think that D is beginning to express an idea that will come into fruition much, much more so later on in Jewish, Muslim, and and Christian philosophy when we do get this idea that God has no body. The book of Deuteronomy doesn't quite say that, but Deuteronomy does clearly say, well, God's body never comes down here to the planet Earth, so it's almost as if, though, God has no body from our point of view. Dr. Summer, in your view, is the D source, the Deuteronomic source, is that late enough to reflect Hellenistic influence? No, certainly not. The four sources were probably put together to form the five books of Moses, or maybe even to form the five books of Moses plus Joshua as a six-book unit. They were put together fairly early in what we call the Persian period. In other words, fairly soon after the Persian Empire defeats the Babylonian Empire and allows the exiled Judeans to go back to Jerusalem. So mm-hmm. that's already before the, the Hellenistic era. That's a good two centuries before Alexander the Great comes into the Near East. Moreover, the four documents themselves, though they were put together to form the Torah in the Persian period, that is after the Babylonian exile, from their language, it's clear that they're all written before the Babylonian exile. We can tell what are the differences between what you might call classical or pre-exilic biblical Hebrew and late biblical Hebrew or post-exilic biblical Hebrew. And with the exception of maybe a couple of words, maybe a few phrases here and there, the Pentateuch is written entirely in classical biblical Hebrew. And from this, it's, I think it's clear that the four sources themselves, all four of them are pre-exilic and certainly, certainly pre-Hellenistic. I don't think that D is influenced by Plato or Aristotle or Hellenistic thought I do think, though, that D represents an Israelite attempt at thinking philosophically, that both D and P, actually, in in their different ways, are very self-consistent, systematic thinkers. They're not philosophers, though I think that had philosophy been available to them, they would have loved that. They would have picked up on it. They're moving in a philosophical direction, But they haven't read Plato, they haven't read Aristotle, they're written before Plato and Aristotle actually were even alive. And so there are ideas that they're trying to express in very concrete ways that later Jewish, Christian, and Muslim philosophers will be able to express better once they've learned the art of abstraction from Plato and especially from Aristotle. It's often the case in a tradition, whether Jewish tradition, Muslim tradition, Hindu tradition, Japanese tradition, that sometimes there are authors in a tradition who are trying to express an idea and they've got a brilliant new insight, but the language of their day, the habits of thought of their culture, don't allow them to express it quite fully. And then centuries later, there are later authors in the same tradition who have picked up from somewhere else some new way of expressing themselves, and they can express those ideas and maybe even understand those ideas better than the scribes or priests or wise people who originally came up with those ideas. And that's what I mean when I say that certainly the biblical authors all agreed that God had some sort of physical existence, that God has some sort of body. But in some ways, I really do think that Maimonides understands 
biblical theology, in some ways better than the biblical authors themselves. Maimonides understands, and there are various, even before Maimonides, I think Christian philosophers who understand that if God never is reproductive and never is sexual and is never limited by physicality and can perceive and act anywhere in the cosmos, regardless of location, well, maybe what that just means is that God is not embodied physically in space and time in any way whatsoever. That's actually an implication of what the biblical authors are saying, but it's not an implication that they themselves were able to understand. Later Muslim, Jewish, and Christian philosophers and theologians, they're able to state that, I think, more clearly. And in a funny way, some of them, I think, therefore, understand biblical theology better than the actual biblical authors did. The way that you describe this debate that's implicit in the Hebrew Bible is in terms of divine fluidity. Mm -hmm. So you have the pro-divine fluidity side and the anti-divine fluidity side. Mm -hmm. And you say there are kind of two aspects to divine fluidity. One is having multiple bodies, which might, in a sense, just pretty much be being able to be multiply located in different places at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you point out that this was popular in the ancient Near East, and you have all kinds of interesting quotations from literature that most of us have not read, where, you know, these, these other deities of these other nations, you know, they have kind of standard manifestations in different cities or different shrines and so on. But then another aspect of divine fluidity was, I think you talk about it in terms of God having more than one self. Is that kind of like more than one persona, more than one personality, even though it's the same being? Correct. Clearly that's the case with ancient Babylonians and Assyrians and Canaanites, I think. Different gods with the exact same name appear separately in worship contexts, but in mythological texts that tell the stories of the gods, there's only one god of that name. The goddess Ishtar shows up ritually in different temples. She can even be worshipped multiply in a single temple. The Ishtar of Ninveh and Ishtar of Arbela are two different goddesses. And yet, at some level, they're the same goddess, because in all the mythological texts, there's only one Ishtar. They never really interact in a story on a narrative level. Mm -hmm. So I think that something similar happens in the Hebrew Bible, in that sometimes there are small-scale manifestations of the creator god, the god who created the universe. And those small-scale manifestations, they are god, but they're not all of god. And so God sort of overlaps with this small-scale manifestation, but only partially. An example of that, I think, would be, let's say, in the story of the burning bush. We're told that an angel of God, the Hebrew word is malach Adonai, appears to Moses as a small flame, except it isn't really a flame because it's inside of the bush, but it doesn't burn the bush up. So it seems to be something like fire, but not exactly fire, inside of the bush. And it's a little bit eerie and scary, but it's not overwhelming, and it is approachable. That Malach Adonai, usually translated as angel, is mentioned at the beginning, but then the conversation is always just between God and Moses. We never hear of the angel again. I think what's going on in that passage, and the same thing is true of many other passages in the Hebrew Bible, is that the word Malach here doesn't really mean what we think of as angel. An angel is somebody who's sent on a mission. It's a different being than God, right? It's not the same person as God. You know, when John Belushi says in Blues Brothers, we're on a mission from God, he's not claiming to be a small-scale manifestation of God. He's just this right. other guy that God has sent to Chicago to do some things. Mm -hmm. Malach sometimes does mean that in Hebrew. It does sometimes mean what we think of as angel, as sort of an emissary. But sometimes in biblical Hebrew, Malach refers to a small-scale manifestation of God. It is God, it's just not all of God. I think actually that Malach in this sense is very, very similar to the Sanskrit term avatara. Avatara in Sanskrit literally means a descent, but an avatara is a small-scale earthly manifestation of a heavenly God, and this earthly manifestation can have some independence, but ultimately, metaphysically, it really is the same as, as the heavenly God. I think that that's what's happening in some of these angelic passages in the Hebrew Bible. Genesis 18 would be another one, actually, where the word malach doesn't even appear, but I think it's the same idea. The three men that appear to Abraham, it gradually becomes clear over the course of the discussion between Abraham and these three men in Genesis chapter 18 
that one of them, or maybe even all three of them, are actually God. It's actually the ruler of the universe embodied in one or maybe even all three of these men. But of course, it's not all of God. It's, it's only a small-scale manifestation of God that is more user-friendly, more approachable, somewhat less frightening, a little bit eerie, but not overwhelmingly frightening the way the full presence of God would be. Doesn't the narrative in Genesis 18 at one point basically say that just one of the three men is God? Well, two of the men leave to go over to the city of Sodom, Sodom in Hebrew, I guess Sodom in English. Uh, they go to Sodom to speak to Abraham's nephew, Lot, and one of them remains with Abraham, and then it's quite clear that that one is God. The question is, what are the other two? Might it be the case that they were temporarily overlapping with God, but now at this point they no longer are? Or were they just accompanying the one man who was God along the way? I think that that's not clear, and the text doesn't want to make that clear because the authors of the text just probably are not quite sure themselves. But clearly one of them does remain, and that one is identified with God, though again, clearly he's not all of God. I mean, suppose you wanted a, a more kind of deflationary interpretation of those angel of the Lord passages. If an angel, like a literal intermediary, a, one of these unseen, this class of unseen beings, if an angel can speak first person for God, and if you can speak to God through speaking with an angel, like how would you tell the difference between if we should take the interpretation you're suggesting or this more sort of, I don't know what to call it, more conservative mm -hmm. interpretation that, that I'm suggesting? I think that there are many passages in which it's hard to tell. And there are some passages where it is very, very clear that the word angel refers to some heavenly or even earthly being separate from God. But there are a number of passages that do seem to identify the Malach with God. So, for example, in Genesis 18 and 19, towards the end of the story, the narrator stops being coy and just refers to one of these beings as God. In fact, the Hebrew word they're used is spelled with the Hebrew letters for Y, H, W, and H. In other words, it's just God's personal name. Uh, mm -hmm. God is simply referred to there by God's personal name, what we sometimes call the, the tetragrammaton or the four-letter name of God that appears throughout the Hebrew Bible. So there, the text is coy for a while, but it stops being coy and does identify one of these beings simply as God. Similarly, Exodus chapter 3 doesn't describe some heavenly being that flies down to earth to talk to Moses and then speaks in the first person on God's behalf. It describes some sort of uncanny, fiery substance inside of the bush. That's not how we usually think of an angel. In fact, that sounds a lot more similar to the glory of God, the presence of God, in Hebrew, kivod Adonai, or just the kavod, which is identified with the actual presence of God in many biblical texts. In fact, later in the book of Exodus, at this exact same place, we're later told the full-fledged glory of God, that fiery substance, comes down from heaven and is on top of that mountain. I think what's happening with Moses is God is starting Moses out slowly. There's a small-scale manifestation of God called the Malach, which I would want to translate here as Avatara, that begins to speak to Moses. That's Moses' first contact with God. And when Moses comes up to speed, Moses will have direct contact with actually the full presence of God, significantly at the exact same location, on Mount Sinai or Mount Horev. The biblical texts use both terms as the name for that mountain. There, that doesn't seem to be a messenger. That just seems to be God, but in a smaller, more accessible, more user-friendly form. There's a passage where God is quoted as saying that no one can see me and live. Mm -hmm. Do you interpret that just as a disagreement with the other biblical authors, or do you think it means something like, no one can see me in my full glory? So that passage from Exodus 33, Lo yir ani hadam v'chai, a human cannot see me and live, I think is expressing a very, very common idea throughout the Bible, namely that God is a physical being or God has some sort of physical presence. You can see it, but if you do see it, you're going to be killed. You're going to be you know, fried to a crisp immediately. It's a very, very common idea throughout the Bible. And actually, similar ideas show up elsewhere in the ancient Near East, in the Mediterranean world, 
What's interesting in the Bible is that a number of characters find out that there are exceptions to this rule. So Moses clearly, according to some biblical authors, is an exception to that rule. When Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, says, I saw God sitting on a throne high and mighty, he makes it clear that he thinks that God is a physical being who can sit on a throne. But he goes on to say, Oili ki nidmeti, woe is me, I'm doomed, for I'm a human being and my eyes have just seen God. He expects that he's about to die. But in fact, then another heavenly creature called a seraph, a kind of flying heavenly snake, flies over to him and purifies his lips or his face with a coal taken from an altar in God's heavenly palace. And somehow this purification allows Isaiah to be another exception to the rule. So Isaiah does see God, is dismayed, but much to his surprise, he doesn't actually die. We can find other examples of this in the Bible. So the general idea is humans cannot see God and live, but there are exceptions to that rule. That having been said, I also think that there are other biblical authors who have different views on this. Again, one of the central ideas of modern biblical criticism is that biblical authors disagreed with each other. Within certain theological boundaries, they have a lot of debate and discussion. So some biblical authors probably think no human being can ever see God and live. Some think generally that's true, but Moses was an exception, Isaiah was an exception, Amos was an exception. But then there are other biblical authors who think that, yeah, lots of people see God. It's not a big deal. They probably only see an avatara. They're only seeing this malach, a small-scale manifestation of God. They're seeing a body of God, but not a terribly destructive body of God like the one that's up in heaven. And it's no big deal when they see God. So Abraham in Genesis 18, he sees God. Not only does it not kill him, but the body of God there is so unspectacular that Abraham doesn't even realize he's dealing with God. He thinks that he's got three human visitors who are probably tired from walking through the desert, and he wants to give them a good meal. It's only, I would say, about halfway through the chapter that we readers begin to realize that, oh my gosh, this is not just three men, but one or maybe all three of them are in fact God. And Abraham doesn't realize that until the end of the chapter. At some point, Abraham does get in on the secret, but it takes a while for him to realize that this is the body of God. That's something that he sees without any, uh, without any health effects. So I've given you really three points of view. You can't see God and live. You can't see God and live generally, but there are exceptions. You can see God and live. A fourth point of view is the book of Deuteronomy. No, no human being has seen or will see God because God lives up in heaven and we live down here on earth. And so there's never any visual perception of God whatsoever because we're just never in the same place. On this issue, there's four different biblical points of view. It's not clear to me that they're wholly inconsistent viewpoints, though, because as you pointed out, the term see is ambiguous. You could see this, you called it a small scale manifestation or avatar of God. And yet there's, there's some kind of scene that goes far beyond that, right? It looks to me like you could even say all four of those things if you meant different things by see. I hear what you're saying. But I'm not positive that the biblical authors would necessarily say that the debate involves the verb to see. I think that the debate rather involves what's being seen. So I don't think that the authors who believe that Malach Adonai can be an avatar of God, I don't think that they would say that they were seeing something but not with their eyes, you know, that something was happening cognitively or at the level of perception I think that they would say that there was this real thing in front of them, and they were really seeing it, but they were aware of the fact that there's much more to God than what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. The Western philosophical tradition begins to introduce much more clearly that we can think about cognition and perception. But I don't know that ancient Near Eastern authors were nearly as sophisticated as later Western philosophers about the difference between what is seen and what is doing the seeing, maybe eventually between signifiers and signifieds, I don't think that they were quite there yet. So you're saying that one ambiguity in the term seeing could have to do with whether or not you're using your eyes, you know, whether it's literal seeing. Another ambiguity, though, could have to do with whether you're perceiving God directly or indirectly. So as you just said, a different object 
it could actually prevent these authors from having a debate if they don't realize that one another are making different assumptions about whether there's just this intermediary object or not. Correct. I don't think that biblical authors give evidence of an understanding that the word see itself could mean not literally seeing, but being caused to have an internal mental experience as if though you were seeing. That kind of as if seeing, I, I don't see any indication in biblical texts that people were thinking about that yet. But once we realize that there can be a difference between seeing and having a mental experience as if though you are seeing, once we realize that that's the case, we might realize that what looked like a debate or a disagreement to them might not have been as much of a disagreement as they thought it was. We've talked about Maimonides. I think that Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed is written strongly rejecting the idea that God can possibly have a body, much less a bunch of bodies. But the reason that Maimonides feels the need to write that book is because Jewish mystical traditions of his time are actually gaining steam and they're reviving the idea that God has multiple bodies or that God can be present in more than one place and that God is fluid and that within the one God's personality, there can be interactions of different aspects of God. Maimonides disagrees with all that, but it's precisely because those ideas are out there, those ideas that are rooted in the J and E traditions of the Pentateuch have come back and are thriving. That's why Maimonides feels it's necessary to write his philosophical work, the greatest work of Jewish philosophy, The Guide for the Perplexed. 